Hey everybody, I'm Brittany. Welcome to Friendship. Thank you for spending part of the Lord's day with us, especially if it's your first time listening in. Before we get started, we wanted to give you a look at some things happening at Friendship. The Bible tells us that tithing is a way to show that we trust God with our lives and our finances. Tithing is meant for our benefit as sacrificing a portion of our income helps us look outside of ourselves and makes us more aware of the needs of others. Tithing is an act that helps us keep our priorities straight and it reminds us that we don't own anything in this life. God is in control and we are only managers of what He has given us. We are truly thankful for all of you who are consistent sacrificial givers to this ministry and you can help regularly support this mission at friendshipbc.com slash give or by using the offering boxes in the back of the worship center. We are thankful for the opportunity to serve our community through the Torrington Soup Kitchen. Our team is there every Tuesday night to serve dinner, visit, and share the love of Christ with the guests. If you would like to serve with us in this critical ministry, go to Friendship com slash soup kitchen to sign up. You can also talk with Pastor Rob for more information. Well, we believe you are listening for a reason. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are at. And our hope is that you leave this time encouraged and closer to him than ever before. Let us know if we can help you in any way by commenting on the live stream and be sure to connect with us at friendshipbc.com and on social media to stay up to date with everything happening here at Friendship. If you are joining us in person, we would like to get to know you. You can fill out a green connect card in the seat back pocket in front of you and drop it in one of the offering boxes in the back of the worship center. And we hope you have a great weekend. I want to be close, close to your side. of angels above singing as one
demons run and flee at the presence of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am great i am great i am oh the great Good morning, church. I don't recognize any of you. Well, I, I am very thankful for the resilience of this church. I'm very thankful for the people of this church. Just a week ago, we were sitting outside freezing half to death to worship and be together and hear the Lord's Word taught. And here we are sitting inside with masks on for the same reason. So glory to God that we're able to do these things. Uh, we're going to start our time this morning with a call to worship. It's coming from the book of Exodus this morning, Exodus chapter 12. I'm going to read the first 13 verses of Exodus chapter 12. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat, and you shall count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you keep it until the fourteenth day of this month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it with your belt fastened, with your sandals on your feet, with your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our God, we are thankful that we're able to get together today, that we're able to celebrate You, to celebrate the victory that we have in our salvation through our Savior Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, this morning that as we continue to sing and our voices cry out, even with our faces covered, Lord, that it would be pleasing to You, that we would glorify You. That when we go to Your Word, that we would make much of Jesus and we would glorify You. That when we take the Lord's table together, we would make much of You and we would glorify You. Because we do glorify You, Lord. And we ask Your blessing upon our time. And we ask that all that we do here this morning would bring honor to You. And that we would make much of Jesus. And we pray this in His name. Amen.
will call on the name of the Lord to God is greater.
I need to keep using that side thing. We're going to have to make it a little bigger. Thank you for laughing at me. Uh, if you'd like to open your Bibles this morning, we are first going to be in the book of Romans, uh, working backwards through three books this morning, Romans, Acts, and then Luke. But we're going to start our time with prayer, so let's bow our heads together. Our God, we are so thankful for the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ. We're thankful for this book. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit teaching us as we open and teach and listen. And we pray this morning, Father, that we're able to set aside whatever distraction might have come in here with us, that we can focus on You and Your Word and Your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning I, we take what I believe is a Spirit-led detour from our normal systematic consecutive exposition of the Scripture. Uh, we're going to be considering two very important things in the life of the believer and the local church, and that is the Lord's table and baptism. Uh, it's important for us to be reminded of what the Scripture teaches on, thing, on these things, as we might be inclined to ascribe either to the bread and the cup or the waters of baptism something that shouldn't be ascribed at all, or something left over maybe from your former religious framework. I want to begin by giving you the most concise definition of the ordinances that I can. The ordinances of the Lord's table and baptism are physical representations of a spiritual reality that is far different, far greater, and much more significant than themselves. They are both outward and visible and physical signs of an inward and spiritual grace and change. They are two things that Jesus uniquely gave to the gathered church to do until His return. That's why we call them an ordinance. They are an order from the Lord Jesus. They are both authoritative orders from our Savior. It's one reason that growing in Christ is a team effort. No Christian is designed to walk alone. Our salvation, although a very private and singular salvation, places us, once saved, into a far greater setting that is a group of other saved sinners, the local church, as we work out our salvation and serve our King together. And these two ordinances of the Lord's table and baptism are designed in part to be a public proclamation of the Gospel. They are public confessions of faith for the local church and her members. Think of when someone comes here, maybe invited by a friend, Maybe you were dragged along against your will. If you were, blink, blink, blink very quickly, and I'll know. Actually, I can't see your faces anyway, so it wouldn't matter. But they, they come here and they see us eating a, a bit of, of bread and a sip of juice, and what on earth is that all about? Why is that woman crying over there? Why is that guy eating that stuff? Why did he just put that lady underwater? And will he let her back up in time? Why are you doing these peculiar things? We do them because of who Jesus is and what He has done for us. And so that will be our framework this morning. We're going to consider first the Gospel, and what, which is what these things point to, and then consider baptism and the Lord's table, which we will then take together at the end. Let's start by considering the Gospel. You're in Romans chapter 1. The reality of the Lord's table and baptism is that they point us to something. They point us to something specific, something tangible and concrete. They don't point us to something nebulous. They point us to something that can be defined. They point us to the reality of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. The Gospel is called the Good News because it addresses the most serious problem that you and I have. Now, you might be thinking we're a few days away from elections, so our biggest problems are the Republicans, or our biggest problems are the Democrats, or our biggest problem is my neighbor that doesn't have my political opinions, or my biggest problem right now is health, or my biggest problem is this. Actually, our biggest problem as human beings is that God is holy, and He is just, and I am not. And at the end of my life, I'm going to stand before a just and holy God, and I will be judged. Romans 1, 
The New Testament frames the gospel really around four questions, and if you've been with us for some time, you're probably very familiar with them. Question one is, who made me and to whom am I accountable? Paul begins this presentation of the gospel in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what, God, for what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to him. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made, so they are without excuse. We did not create ourselves, and we are not self-reliant or self-accountable. If, God, if it is God who created us, and I believe it is, therefore, it is God who has the right to demand our worship and our obedience. So the question of creation is critical. The way you answer, where do I come from, is critical. Am I just a product of time plus matter plus chance? Or am I fearfully and wonderfully made by a Creator? Am I simply part of a race of mankind that is the pinnacle, uh, that, is, that is just dust? We're all just cosmic dust dancing to our DNA? If we come from nothing, listen to me, if we come from nothing and we go to nothing, then we are nothing. And nothing we do, nothing we accomplish, nothing really matters. I want to sing Queen right there. Nothing really matters. Because if, if we come from nothing and go to nothing, then what, what, what does anything mean? However, if we are made by God, if we are designed with purpose, then what we do has eternal significance, doesn't it? The, the second question is, is what, our prob, what is our problem? Our problem is that we have rebelled against God. And we know that there is a problem. Everyone knows that there is a problem in this world. We just turn on any form of media and we can see it. And of course, every generation has their own brand of trouble. And people say, well, it's, it, it's so bad. Everything's bad today. Well, yeah, it's bad, but it's just different. Every generation has had their own brand of bad. And you say, well, I, I don't believe sin has affected me or, or every part of creation. And you say, well, I'm really ambivalent toward God. I'm antagonistic toward God. Friends, in reality, you are rebelling against God. Every day that you reject His Son, you are rebelling against your Creator God. And in Romans 1, Paul says that if we continually rebel against God, He might just let us continue on that path. Verse 21, Although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and the birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in their lusts and their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who was blessed forever. Amen. We reject Creator God and we make up our own little perfect, feeble, little g-gods. That's the root and essence of sin, isn't it? And the result is nothing short of horrific. For the next few chapters in Romans, Paul makes the case, he continues with this theme, and he says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That is why the world is what the world is today. Sin gives birth to sin, which gives birth to sin. And you say, no, I don't believe that. I think, I think mankind is, is genuinely good. Then go to Walmart, leave all of your valuables in your car, leave the windows down and unlocked, and go shop. Or leave your house unlocked tonight. Or give me your credit card and your social security. Why don't we do that? Because we know the, that in reality, and the Bible says this, the heart of man is wicked above all things. Well, what about all the nice people out there? Aren't there nice people out there in the world? And I hear this a lot, that he's a nice guy or she's a nice person. That's probably true. True, certainly according to our fallen human standards of niceness. When we say nice, we're talking about people who won't break into our car and steal our stuff. But God does not grade on our curve, does He? When we say things like that, we're talking about our own standard. God, however, is holy and perfect, so God demands that all men and women be holy and perfect. And you say, how on earth is that possible? 
Because Paul tells us we are sinners and hopelessly lost. What hope is there? That leads to the third question of the Gospel. What is the hope? What is God's solution to our problem of sin? If we are sinners, if we are unable to save ourselves, we are completely hopeless. Unless a solution is given by the One who created us, that solution is Jesus Christ. The sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God demands perfection for salvation. He demands perfect righteousness. And despite our rebellion against God, we can be justified, made perfectly righteous through redemption that is available to us in Jesus Christ. Jesus was born without sin. Lived a life of perfect obedience to Father God. Without sin, He died a perfect, innocent substitute on our behalf. He became that sacrificial Passover lamb that we read about from Exodus. If our problem is separation from God, that separation is due to our sin. Our sin problem is solved through Jesus Christ alone. That leads, of course, to question four. How am I included in this? How do I take part in all of this? God demands perfection. This is how you do it. You have two options. God demands perfection. So option one is be perfect. Live a perfect life. Never act out of anger. Never get road rage in Connecticut while you're driving an orange Mini Cooper. Never get mad at someone who has a different political opinion than you. Never raise your voice at your children out of anger. Never act selfishly. Never act out of lust. Never, 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 never. How are we doing so far? Yeah, welcome to the club. We all did just on the drive in this morning. What are we talking about? Quiet down! We're going to church to worship God, children. Look at that idiot in front of me. We all fail at this, don't we? We don't have it in us to do this, but Jesus does. He says, here, you can have my righteousness. You can have my perfection because you can't do it. We are saved by believing in Jesus Christ, by trusting Him and no other to save. This leads to our baptism which is our second heading. Flip back one book. Is it one book? Sure. One book to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 for context. Paul and and Silas are in uh, Corinth. No, they're in Philippi. And they're preaching the Gospel and they, they end up going to jail because of it. Pick up in verse 25. And it says, About midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all those who were in his house, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Faith, belief, leads to salvation. Which leads to an outward expression of an inward change in baptism. Now as context, and this is probably no surprise to anyone, my view of baptism is decidedly from the Baptist tradition. Which, in my years of study, I believe is the most biblically accurate. If I didn't, I wouldn't be preaching in a Baptist church. But before we consider what baptism is, we must be sure of what baptism is not. We must consider first from the negative before we can consider the positive. First, baptism is not how we get saved or stay saved. In other words, baptism does not wash away our sin. Here's the interactive part of this this morning. I'm going to sing one bar from one of the old hymns, and I want you to sing the rest of the line. Are you ready? Everyone 
loosen up a little bit. You're all pretty stiff. Ready? What can wash away my sin? Everyone over the age of 40 just got it like that. We don't sing nothing but getting baptized because baptism doesn't save us. It is Jesus who saves us. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward reality. You are proclaiming to the world that you are in Christ and that you are now living your life for Him. And it is done in this peculiar way of immersion in water. The overwhelming evidence in the Scripture is that baptism is to be done following conversion or following your faith in Jesus Christ. You don't see years of time elapse between salvation and baptism in the Bible. If you are waiting to be baptized, what are you waiting for? Have you, since you have come to Christ, been baptized by immersion? If not, we can get you baptized because you're in a Baptist church. It's what we do. We love, and see my hands, I get all greedy when I talk about baptism because I love it. We can baptize you. It's one of my favorite things to do. Sorry if that was freaky. It is what it is. We're planning on our next Baptism 101 in December. I believe it's on the 2nd, which is a Wednesday night. Baptisms planned for December 13th. What a great time of year to be baptized right before Christmas, during the Christmas season. All of the information about that's going to be in our weekly update. If you're not part of that, go to friendshipbc.com, sign up for our weekly update. It's also going to be on Facebook or Instagram, so we're going to be getting the message out there. So if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're now no, not baptized, there's no better time than now, is there? So although baptism follows conversion, we are not saved by that act. We are saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, and it's all by God's grace alone. So then, we've established what it's not. We must must then understand what it is. Baptism is a command for those who are in Christ. That's what makes it an ordinance. Jesus told us to do it. We are to make disciples, and that begins with their baptism. Discipleship begins with your baptism. The act of going down into the water identifies with Jesus' death and burial. Coming up from the water identifies with His resurrection, an outward expression of an inward reality. A physical representation of something that is different, far greater, and much more significant than itself. So, with that clarification about the Gospel and baptism, we must come to the conclusion that only those who can say from a regenerated heart, Jesus Christ is my Savior. Only someone who can say that should be baptized. The first question I ask people when they say, I want to be baptized is, are you a believer in Jesus Christ? That's why we hold a relatively simple one-on-one class here. Some, Some have been critical saying, listen, you shouldn't have people go through a class, you should just baptize them. I think that's foolish. Because that, cl- that class is one for me to get to know you and to understand how you came to know Christ and to do- make sure you understand what baptism is. It might delay baptism for a short time. And I'm not suggesting that people wait seven years to prove to me that they're a Christian. I simply want you to understand what it is. And I want to understand whether or not you truly are in Christ by what your confession And I believe this is very important because I've had many conversations where people say, you know what, man, I saw that baptism service. I'm all jazzed up. I want to get baptized. And that's awesome. That's wonderful. And then I say, can you tell me when you came to trust Christ and what He's been doing in your life since that time? Sometimes I get, oh my goodness, let me tell you everything. But sometimes I I get a blank stare. Because they may not have had any real conversion. It was simply, they were caught up in the emotion of the moment, but they're not truly in Christ. Now that doesn't mean I'm like, all right, get out of my office, you heathen. It just gives me an opportunity to share the gospel and lead them to Christ and, and baptism. We really don't want anyone sitting here or in the waters misled to believe that this act somehow saves them. That the waters are magical or that I have some type of mystical powers because I don't. At least as far as I know. That's why some come for baptism as a means to convert from other religions or to accomplish some means of salvation. And that's when we have the opportunity to speak the gospel into their situation. And like all that we do, we desire to act biblically. 
And every indication in the New Testament is that baptism was administered by immersion, meaning going under the water. The primary Greek verb used in the New Testament is baptizo, which literally means to immerse someone. And we see that with the, the, uh, the jailer in Philippi that we read. We also see it in Acts chapter 16 with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. In fact, it says when they came up out of the water, the Lord suddenly took Philip away. They were all baptized by immersion, going down into the waters, a symbolic cleansing, a ritualistic way to demonstrate an inward conversion. And finally, as it relates to baptism, we believe that the Bible teaches a believer's baptism. Baptism is intended for somebody who believes. That's why I don't baptize infants, and that's why I hesitate with smaller children. As cute, as wonderful as it might be to, to get little Timmy baptized when he's six years old and the family and the grandparents can, you know, and Facebook and everything else. I don't see any evidence to indicate that we must baptize infants or small children until they can understand what the gospel is. The evidence that I see in the New Testament is that those who come to Christ, those who are able to comprehend the salvific faith would then be baptized. Now, as parents, we can certainly help point our children to Jesus, but there are, they are the ones to decide if they will commit their lives to Him. As a general rule here, and it's not a hard and fast rule, but we typically wait until the child's about 10 years old because that's when children move from a very concrete thinking to being able to think in more complex terms. And at that age, one of the pastors here will talk to you and your child and help them make the right decision. Any instance of baptism follows a person's decision to trust Jesus for his or her salvation and a commitment to follow Him. And we want children to be able to express that on their own. That brings us to the third and last heading, which is the Lord's table. If you flip back two books to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, I'm going to read from verse 14. This is what it says. And when the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you that I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is poured out for you as the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. The Lord's Supper is like baptism in that it is possessing all the elements of an ordinance. It is an order from Jesus Christ. But it is unlike baptism in that in baptism, baptism is an initiation. It is the starting gun in our discipleship. The Lord's table is a continuing event meant to be observed again and again throughout the Christian life. We don't suggest people get baptized every month, but we do have the Lord's table every month. Baptism happens once. The Lord's table, we celebrate for the rest of our lives. It's an ongoing expression of the life and power of the gospel working in us. Baptism once, Lord's table for the rest of our sanctification. So let's consider the Lord's table from two angles, the, the very practical and then the spiritual. Practically, like baptism, the Lord's Supper is intended for believing Christians. And that's why every month you hear me give the warning, if you're not in Christ, I invite you to pass. Or if you are in Christ, but are in deep, habitual, unrepentant sin, I invite you to pass. Now, I'm not being exclusionary or mean. I actually invite you to pass for your own benefit. Paul gives a very solemn warning to the Corinthian church when they gathered to partake the Lord's Supper. The Corinthian church was all kinds of messed up. Paul actually wrote two letters to them telling them that. But in the very first one, the problem was with how they were taking the Lord's Supper. He says, Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he then does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many of you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. Now, we're all sinners. 
So you don't need to be sinless to, to take the Lord's table because if that was the requirement, we would never have it again because I couldn't take it. But if you're just going off the rails with unrepented sin and you have no repentance about it, I would invite you to pass and then you and I can get together and we can talk through the sin problem in your life. And this is really left up to your own conscience. We don't, we don't go around checking off boxes of who is and who is not taking the Lord's table. I'm not peering into your windows at night. Could you imagine? You're sitting on the couch and you look over and it's like... It'd be horrifying. It is truly between you and God. I would hope you would invite me in if you saw that. And I believe me, nobody here is judging you. If you have to pass on taking the Lord's table, no one is judging you. No one is looking around going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I know why he's passing. Because we're too busy examining our own hearts, aren't we? They meant somebody. I can't tell if you guys are here because the master on all I see is just blank stares. No smiles or anything. We use small cups of juice and bits of bread. Actually, right now we're using, the, I call them the Lifeway Special, the Corona Special these things, but we can comment on flavor and the rest, but whether the bread used in the Lord's Supper is prepackaged or fresh baked, or it's not as important to me as what's going on in our hearts in the act of the Lord's table itself. Actually, John Calvin emphasized grace when he wrote the, his Institutes of the Christian Religion. He said, uh, in regard to the external form of the ordinance, whether or not believers are to take into their hands and divide among themselves, or each is to eat what is given to them, whether they are to return the cup to the deacon or hand it to their neighbor, whether their bread is to be leavened or unleavened, and the wine, red or white, is of no consequence. These things are indifferent and left free to the church. The Bible makes one thing clear. Wine and bread are both a gift from God, but the Lord's table is a far greater gift to us. So we should be biblical in our practice, charitable in our differing differing with brothers and sisters, and share the Lord's table in faith and joy. So now let's consider this from the spiritual perspective. The the true character of the Lord's Supper is really seen in its past, present, and future significance. The past significance of the Lord's table is that it reminds us of something, doesn't it? That's why Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me, because it reminds us of what he's done for us. It keeps us from self-righteousness. It keeps us from saying, well, I understand why Jesus chose me. Jesus chose you because He's God. We remember His substitutionary atonement in the broken bread, representing the Lord's broken body, and in, in the wine, representing His shed blood. Atonement has to do with our being made right with God, the covering of our sin. Substitutionary means that it was achieved by the death of someone else in our place. Apart from Christ, a man or a woman would die twice. Die physically and then die spiritually. Death is separation. Physical death is separation of the spirit from the body. Uh, Spiritual death, however, is the separation of of our soul and spirit from the mercy and grace of God forever. What we studied last week, the second death. We deserve that separation as a consequence for sin. But Jesus became our substitute by experiencing both physical and spiritual death in our place. And we also, so we don't only look back, we also look up. We look up to Jesus That's the present significance of the Lord's table. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is alive. Jesus is working in our lives right now. Jesus is engineering your life for your good. No matter how much you try to de-engineer your life, Jesus is still engineering your life for your good and His glory. And I believe, as the Reformers did, that Christ is present in our service of communion, spiritually, not physically. That's the view I hold. Calvin calls it the real presence to indicate a spiritual presence which is every bit as real as a physical one. Now, perhaps you come from the Roman Catholic tradition which teaches the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church teaches something called transubstantiation with the blood and the, 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 the wine and the bread actually become blood and the body. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I reject that teaching altogether. 
But I do, I do believe there's a real presence of Christ with us today, just like there is a real presence of Christ in our life at all times. Just like every other promise in the New Testament where Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we look back, we look up, and we look ahead. Paul said, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Before Corona, we had the, the golden things where we'd pass them around. It's as if we're saying here, this is the gospel. Take and eat. Be part of the work of Christ. The Lord suggested the same when he told the disciples. Uh, he said, I, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. We speak of the real presence of the Lord in the service as we know it now, and we seek to respond to Him and serve Him. And we readily admit that there are times when it is difficult and the Lord doesn't seem to be present. Have you ever come to, to, to worship or to take the Lord's table and you're like, Bleh. does anyone feel like that today? It's okay to admit it. I, I don't know how other to describe that mood other than that. Maybe it's sin in your life, and, and you come to the Lord's table and you're like, ugh. I can't take this. Or maybe it's fatigue. Is anyone fatigued over the past 10 months of the year? And we come to the Lord's table and we're like, ah. Or maybe it's misplaced faith when you feel self-righteous and you don't feel like you need to take part in the Lord's table and you take it and you're like, ah. Very theological terms I'm using, I know. And though we continue on in the Christian life and in service, we long for the day when we will see Him face to face. And this is the most wonderful part of the Lord's table, for me anyway, is that this time is a reminder of the day when we will sit and feast together in the kingdom of God. This is just an appetizer of the glory to come. And when we'll be sitting around with Jesus in the very presence of God at the greatest feast that we've ever seen, sitting together closer than six feet apart with no masks on, eating the best food we've ever had. Glory to God. Our fellowship will be sweet. Jesus Christ will be our host. And all of these signs will have become fulfilled. That spurs me on not only to, to, to continue to do what I do, but it spurs me on to holiness in my own life. So friends, I want to close our time this morning by taking the Lord's table together. As you take the bread and the cup, you, you should have received it when you walked in from the table in the back. If you don't, just raise your hand and one of our welcoming team can get you one. But in the quiet of your own heart, cry out to God to show, that, to, to show you any part of your heart or mind that needs correction. Repent of your sin, and we'll celebrate the Lord's table together. Maybe. This is what the Bible says. The Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, He took bread. And when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. Continues. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Well, we will close our time in prayer this morning, and after I'm done praying, we will be dismissed. Um, I'm just going to give you a few instructions on how to leave. Uh, it's very challenging for Baptists not to visit. Uh, we are typically accustomed to being to hang around in this room and visit, but we're asking just for everyone's safety that uh, once we're dismissed, just if you want to visit, just do so outside. It's relatively nice out today, and we're going to try to keep this, this room and the foyer empty. Uh, that was the nice way of saying it. The, the Goulet way of saying it is you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. 
Let's pray. Our God, we are so thankful for these things that you have left us to identify with you, to glorify you, to to tell others about you, to confess our faith in you. And we ask, Father, that throughout this week we would be reminded of your command for us to be holy as you are holy. Father, draw us closer to you through our relationships with other believers, through our time in your word, through our, our, our time in prayer with you. Make us more like our Savior. And friend, if you feel God calling on you and pulling on your heart and you want to cry out to Him to be saved, you could just say, Dear Lord, I realize now I am more sinful than I ever before would admit. But I understand now that through Jesus, I am more loved than I ever before could imagine. Please save me now. For Christ's sake and His glory. Amen. God bless, church.